Hi, good day everyone, and welcome to today's webcast. Laura Wan, the Agile Game Changer for Industry 4.0. So let's have a little look at some housekeeping rules here uh, in order to make sure we know what's going on. So at the bottom of your screen are multiple application engagement tools down there. Um, submit your questions through the Q&A engagement tool. Today's, uh, a copy of today's slide deck is available in the additional materials available in the resource list. The webcam is being streamed through your computer, so there's no dial-in number. You've probably figured that out now. Some networks cause slides to advance slower than others. If your slides are behind, please press the SF5 key on your keyboard. It will refresh the page, so that's a great tip. You can find additional answers to some of your help uh, questions, again, at the bottom of the uh, screen in the engagement tool. And this on-demand version of, of this webcast will be available about a day or so after it finishes airing here today. So without further ado, let's move over to introducing the panelists today. Let's meet the team discussing how LoRaWAN has been a game changer in the upstream oil and gas, chemical plants, mining and construction industries. My name is Daniel Quant. I work at Multitech and I'm going to be your moderator today. And we have uh, Denny Gior, who is uh, from World Sensing. Um, he has over 15 years experience in R&D in the field of mining, raw material storage and tailing dams. We have Philip Daru from Chevron, who leads the industrial network team supporting Chevron's digital transformation globally. We have Joseph Fani, a highly experienced sales and technology leader from Weeby, combining innovation and analysis. We have uh, Frank Gillison from Aloxi, who brings a ton of experience in the oil and gas industry with a strong background in chemical engineering. Last and definitely not least, we have Kevin Zamzow from Yokogawa, who leads the America's Emerging Solutions Team for Industrial Automation and Life Innovations, delivering industrial IoT solutions for plant asset management, AI anomaly detection. So first uh, off, let me introduce who the LoRa Alliance is. The LoRa Alliance is a open non-profit association of about 400 members that was launched back in 2005. Its focus is to standardize low power wireless access networks and promote the LoRa WAN protocol. It develops and maintains an open, open technical LoRaWAN specification and develops a certification plan and works with global test labs around the world to make sure that you can simply and quickly certify your devices. So look for the LoRaWAN certified mark. There's a number of different types of membership. Sponsor members are eligible for board positions. Contributor members, as the name would suggest, are contributing to the, uh, the specifications and the certification environment. And adopter and institutional members bring a wealth of domain experience into the alliance. We have a broad set of members across the complete ecosystem. We have chipset vendors, module vendors to help speed up the device development, devices that are sensors and actuators. We have um, gateway manufacturers for densifying inside buildings and, and providing macro coverage, network server vendors, mobile network operators and communication service providers that can scale out your LoRaWAN network. We have data management platforms for AI and machine learning. And we have solution providers that have pulled all of this together to solve specific industry challenges. And we have a world-class group of system integrators who can pull your LoRaWAN solution together for you. So LoRaWAN is now successfully being scaled and deployed globally. LoRaWAN now has 150 operators in well over 160 countries 
deploying public networks with literally thousands of private enterprise wireless network deployments on LoRaWAN as well. So things are really heating up now here globally for low power wireless access networks and LoRaWAN specifically. So what is LoRaWAN? Well, LoRaWAN is a low power wireless access network technology, specifically addressing low bit rate and long range devices. And these really make up the majority of IoT devices out there. LoRaWAN uses license exempt frequencies, typically in the sub gig range, because that provides the best range. Uh, it provides bi-directional acknowledged communication in a simple star network topology. So imagine connecting actuators that are telling motors or pumps to turn on and turn off, as well as sensor harvesting. It provides accurate localization so that you can track and trace your assets and people and is, um, is low cost sensors and gateways that are designed for long battery life, long life in the field in very dense environments. Um, fully secure with not, not only the network layer, but the application layer uh, using AES-128 and a sturdy RF link budget of well over 160 dB in most regions. Now, you often will hear that LoRa and LoRaWAN are used interchangeably. This is not really technically correct. LoRa is the physical layer and LoRaWAN is the software layer that sits above the physical layer and below the application layer, often referred to as a Mac layer or medium access control. And this enables a link layer um, adaption and also coding and decoding of data according to specific channel plans in different regions. Um, also ties into uh, the back end layers and, and we have a, a, a broad roadmap um, enhancing performance, security, roaming, integration to application protocols, ease of deployment and, uh, and so on. So Laura, simply put, is the best wireless trade-off between long range, long battery life, low cost and density of connected assets. Your panelists today will provide you with loads of different key performance indicators and flexibility that they found in LoRaWAN and how they were able to integrate and provide the coverage and the security that they needed for their business. So, uh, so you'll see a number of these um, benefits and differentiations coming through here in today's presentation. So this is my last slide, and I wanted to take this opportunity to introduce a new white paper that we've developed at the LoRa Alliance. LoRa WAN, a digital revolution for oil and gas from SCADA to industrial IoT. This white paper deep dives the impact that LoRa has had on connecting underserved and often stranded assets in oil and gas industries to digitize their operations and to be able to reach decarbonization targets. It showcases the agility of LoRaWAN to deploying greenfield sites, monitoring assets and tracking people. But it also highlights brownfield sites where LoRaWAN can integrate into existing process control networks, even when isolated and on-prem. And it explains hazardous zone certifications and which use cases would require those kind of certifications. We have a great insight from a number of the member companies here um, who contributed their domain experience. You can download it from the LoRa Alliance webpage under the industrial vertical market segment. So without further ado, let's hear from Philippe at Chevron about upstream oil and gas. Thank you, Dan. Um, Thank you for the introduction. Yes, um, for us, uh, we really looked at what is IoT, right, and how it can support our environment. Um, and that's the reason why uh, Chevron joined the Law Alliance to be able to make sure that uh, we talk to the different manufacturers, vendors, everybody in the ecosystem. So uh, 
the oil and gas requirements are really well understood and can be taken into account when uh, sensors and gateways are, are uh, manufactured, but also the whole ecosystem. You know, uh, we saw an evolution uh, from when we started. I think we were early adopter of, of LoRaWAN and, and to now. So uh, quickly, I'm going to go to what we think are, are the, the key oil and gas requirements uh, for that. So. Uh, for people working in oil and gas, of course, ingress protection. It's uh, the level of protection that you have. Uh, how your sensor or your gateway that will be put in the field can, can support the environment. Additionally, I mean, we operate in very cold environment, very hot environment, depending on where we are, you know. Uh, so the, we need to have some equipment that can support wide operating temperature range. Uh, additionally, we have some hazardous area re requirements. Um, ATEX, IECX, class one, dev two, zone one, zone two. Um, it's not always the case, I would like to say, right? I mean, if we put in a plant, in a, in a refinery, there's more chance of that. But if we are, for example, in a very wide upstream onshore field, we might not have those requirements depending on where the sensor will be located. But it's always good to know that it's something to think about. Uh, so if you want your products to be used, uh, they at least need to, to have those requirements for where they need to be used for. Um, what is very interesting as well for us is, is the power. Um, and, and LoRa one, most of the LoRa one sensors are based on, on battery and it's part of the standards. And that makes a big difference, you know, um, when you have to bring power, there are some locations, there's no existing power. So you have to uh, put a MOC management of chain, to bring some power and it can be very costly, uh, which is the case with existing wired sensor. What is also very important for us is about standardization. Um, we don't want to, to work and adopt a, a technology that will be completely changed in two to three years because it's not a standard technology or uh, sensors that are manufactured for this technology now are proprietary and you cannot use them on your full ecosystem. That would be really detrimental to us. We don't want to put a system uh, an infrastructure every time for a different system. I think in oil and gas, we are moving like everybody else with uh, infrastructure uh, as, a, as a standard, uh, infrastructure as a system, so we can really manage the environment much easier. So standardization is very important for us. Uh, with standardization came also the concept of scalability. Um, again, we were early adopters. There were a lot of uh, proof of concept of pilots, but once you arrive at, at this level, what can you do? You know, you need to have an enterprise solution that's scalable. Otherwise, you will do a lot of them, a lot of small proof of concept, but you cannot extend to other business units, for example. Additionally, I mean, some of the requirements for sure are cybersecurity. I mean, uh, I think some of the panel members will talk later on about uh, activities where there were some issue. Um, but you want to make sure that anything you put in the field cannot be hacked and, uh, and malicious activity because, again, we are monitoring equipment in the field that uh, you don't want anybody to have access to that can create problem, right? Uh, also, we want to have easy installation, monitoring, and maintenance. Um, Again, I think I, I, I already talked about it, about the power, but uh, not only power, but you, when you have a wired sensor or wired gateway, you need to bring uh, those cables to where you need to, 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 to be able to deliver that. So uh, LoRa one help us in that space because most of the sensors are, are battery operated and you only need to, to replace them every so often. So easy installation, you just put them where they need to and, and you just connect to them. Um, and, and finally, the big advantage of, for us in the IoT space is really about the CapEx and OPEX, right? I mean, um, the cost of the sensor we see is way, way uh, below. I mean, uh, ratio 1 to 5, sometimes 1 to 10 compared to no normal, I would say, PCN type sensors. And operation uh, is really less expensive as well because you don't have to put everything uh, in a Pi server or thing like that. And I will talk more about it on the next slide. So knowing all that, I mean, look at the IoT environment. What are the use cases for oil and gas for IoT, including LoRaWAN? Uh, I mean, again, when we started early adopter, we did a lot of testing and a lot of POC with pressure, temperature, location, uh, equipment monitoring. Um, 
we also did a, a few a few activity a few pilot about uh, equipment and personal safety tracking uh, that really help monitor your environment and know where your assets are. Um, also looking at remote site monitoring, we have a lot of uh, hard to reach uh, area, remote shelter, where you still want to be able to monitor what's going on, uh, maybe access control as well, see if anybody enter the facility they were not supposed to, where you don't have infrastructure that can support that. Uh, could it be cellular or, or even, you know, uh, microwave, but LoRa support that environment. Um, more and more, we also see we also see, also see a lot of capability in uh, HES, um, really supporting uh, field worker, but also uh, you know regulation like methane monitoring, noise monitoring, thing like that. At the end of the day, you know what we want to do with IoT is really bring more data, uh, valuable data, uh, into our, our environment without having to spend the same amount of money we used to have to uh, to support that. And by doing that and bring all that data to the cloud, now you can do some analytics of preventive maintenance and better understand your environment, be more reactive, and bring it back to your uh, worker in the field that are facing that environment. Again, trying to keep the, the people safe, try keep, trying to keep the environment safe as well and do the work uh, the best way possible and securely. So this slide is more about what is really IoT for us. Really IoT, I mean, we, if, we, if you compare it to the uh, Purdue model, you know, at the PCN level where you have level zero to level four and then you go to the cloud if you want, it's really enabling you to, to put equipment in the field and bring that data all the way back directly to, to, the, to, the, uh, to the cloud where you have your IoT hub and get all that data available in a safe and secure manner without having all the management of change of putting anything at different level in you, into your uh, PCN model, right? Um, typically, the, the wired sensor would be at the level zero. Uh, then, you, I mean, that wired sensor, you need, it's wired, so you need to put at minimum power and, and you know, RS-485 or Modbus or what type, whatever type of protocol you have to talk to it. It goes to your PLC at the level one. Now you need to reprogram your PLC to take into account your wired sensor. Then you have you have the local touch screen, you go to the control room, HMI, all that. Every time you add a few sensors, you add more to your environment. And it, every time it's adding, uh, you know, more equipment, you pay for it. Uh, and also you need to make sure it has to go to all that firewall. So it's it's not only a, uh, it's automation, it's a PCN, it's a network team, IT, OT team, all, all those teams are involved. And, and it could be a very inexpensive sensor, but at the end you really arrive at a very expensive product. Um, and, and so for us, IoT is really leverage for uh, being able to remote monitor the environment, get the data you need when you need it, and be flexible and scalable about it. Uh, and being able to get that data where you need at, at any point. So, we wanted to present uh, today uh, uh, what has been done. So this project was for our San Joaquin uh, Valley business unit where they were an early adopters and they really leveraged uh, LP1 technology to a LoRa one, low power wide area network to to get data that they didn't, they, they needed before to send people and get manually uh, that data. So you can, uh, you, what, you don't really see the scale on that picture, but it's a very, very wide area. Uh, and, and you had to send crews to go, uh, every month and, and get that data. And sometimes if you missed uh, a few days, you would not get the right data and you would have to readjust. So, uh, there was a big, big advantage of, of uh, for us to move in to Laura one, uh, again, because of the long range characteristic that Dan talked about earlier. Uh, about five to eight, ten miles, depending on the on the terrain. Very low power. Again, you, we use Barry, and very low cost. You know, uh, the only issue that we had at the time is, is that we were early adopters, so uh, there was no really uh, sensor that we could deploy that was already available for us, and and so. This is why, I mean, the team had to kind of create their own sensor, design it, and we don't want to be in that, in that model, right? We want to partner with the, with the manufacturers and the vendors to better understand and make sure they understand what we expect from them. So this was really what we, we looked at. Uh, and, 
a lot of the technical summary there I'm not going to talk about because I already mentioned them. Um, so here is an example of what we, we've done, right? We put a, a, a LoRaWAN sensor on top of a, of a tank and give you the, the, the tank gauging and, and a, a little box, you send the, the data to LoRaWAN. Um, we use cell modem at the time to send back the, as a backhaul, uh, but we are looking at different ways to do that. You don't always have to use cell modem if you have an existing infrastructure and, and the capability to secure it, uh, maybe through VLAN or VRF, you can, you can do that. But for the, for the San Joaquin Valley, I mean, it's a very, very, uh, you know, good experience. There was more than 30 multi-tech LoRaWAN gateway and a total of about 3,000 sensors that were deployed and still active nowadays. So it's been going on for three years. We are now modern, modernizing it. Uh, and it's a good example of what Lo LoRaWAN can bring for, for, for your environment. Uh, Equipment that you could not monitor in the past, now you can do it at, at a very good price point uh, and, and really support uh, the film. So um, I think we can now move to uh, uh, Kevin Zamzov from Yokogawa. He's going to give you more detail on, on what uh, they provide for us, for example, and for the oil and gas industry. Okay. Thank you, Philippe. Um, so Philippe, you know, shared, you know, some of the importance of sensing in, in his slides as far as, you know, what it takes to be an industrial sensor. But, you know, much of the discussion, you know, around IIoT um, applications is on the cloud and on the analytics. But I want to take a few minutes at least to talk about the sensing portion of, of the solution, because without, without good sensing, availability, reliability, um, and having quality data, you, you won't reach your digital transformation and industrial Internet of Things type uh, goals. So um, digital transformation or Industry 4.0 efforts are often the initiators of industrial Internet of Things projects. Companies like Yokogawa have developed some digital maturity models to help end users understand the current state of their uh, transformation process and define next steps in the digital transformation maturity um, improvements. Sensing capability is one of the most basic states. Uh, again, sending inaccurate or unreliable data to the cloud makes analytics and further actions meaningless. So quality sensors you know, is, is critical. Um, there are often very good existing PCN sensors, as Philippe shared, but there's also, you know, some coverage gaps, perhaps with balance of plant or stranded assets, or even for new applications, such as was shared for, you know, vendor managed inventory, perhaps of, of chemical tanks or, or other um, products. So as we're talking about industrial applications, the sensors have to withstand, you know, tough conditions. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Interoperability is very key um, to avoid stranded assets, uh, to be able to have the ecosystem of companies, you know, like Aloxy and World Sensing you'll be hearing from in a few minutes, um, so that you, you have the solutions covered and you have, you know, some, you know, insurance that there will still be, you know, the solutions available years from now. So lower WAN certification ensures some of the interoperability um, you can go to the, you know, the site and be able to look for different sensors. Um, one of the things, you know, that uh, Yokogawa is doing with our sushi sensor concept is that we've taken uh, like sushi where you have the filling and the, the rice and the, the seaweed wrapper. We've kind of standardized on uh, the radio, the LoRa technology and the battery being in one part of the sensor so we can have approval and certifications with that to be able to speed the provision of additional sensors like temperature and pressure, but they all use the same radio so that's certified for global use by all the different radio laws around the world, um, as well as then combining those for, for other approvals. So for, as far as uh, you know, industrialness of the applications, you know, as, as Philippe mentioned, you know, ingress protection, you know, th these are tough environments. You know, you may, you may be in a very dusty area. You may be in an area that's exposed to, you know, the, the elements, snow, uh, rain, 
um, you know, et cetera. So having something that meets ingress protection of 67 or better. For some applications, you may need to withstand, you know, a spray down. So IP69K, you know, type certification is important. Of course, it gets cold and hot, you know, out in, in areas. Uh, San Joaquin Valley, I believe, would be an example of a very warm, you know, location. Uh, I've been to Bakersfield and that area very often, and you have 115 Fahrenheit commonly or more during the day. But it also gets very cold. Minus 40 is common in parts of Canada and other areas. So operating, you know, operating in those conditions is important. And one of the key things for operating there is the batteries and the power. So be aware of how the bat your batteries are affected by um, cold temperatures or hot temperatures to make sure that you know they, they you have uh, good sensor availability uh, as the temperatures change. Hazardous location approval is critical. We're working in environments that may frequently have you know, presence of, of uh, gases that, that could ignite if sparked. And so we need to meet local hazardous location requirements. And again, this is a global, so you're looking for a global partner who is taking care of, you know, FM or Canada for CSA or UL for the U.S. Um, you've got ATEX for Europe. You have IECX. So there's many different approvals that are required depending on where you are globally. Um, typically, you know, zone one or two or class one div two is what we're seeing for these types of sensors. Um, another consideration that you see in the PCN world is, you know, if we are, if the sensors are coming in contact with some of the, the chemicals or even with the environment, if it's, you know, um, having the right metallurgy uh, is necessary. Like we have uh, Yokogawa, you know, supplies a lot of pressure transmitters with Hastel IC uh, to be able to withstand, you know, the, you know, their exposure to the, process. Um, and then lastly, what I wanted to, you know, share is that, you know, connectivity to the cloud is, is often one of the, the end goals, but there's also local connectivity requirements that we're seeing requests, whether it's to local control systems, local displays, you know, et cetera. So being able to support industrial protocol translation, for example, to OPC UA, might be through the gateway type application or some other type of translation box, but the sensors, you know, understanding how to take the data from them and translate that, you know, into a, a common industrial protocol um, is, is very important. So, uh, you know, again, this is, you know, one of the key areas is, you know, quality sensing. It all, it all starts, you know, if you want to get to the destination, you need to start with good quality sensors. So. Um, with that, I'm, I'm going to pass it uh, over to uh, Joseph, and uh, he will uh, share some of the next information. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate the great insights you provide and awesome work to you and the Yokogawa team. Hello, everyone. It's an honor to present to you all from across the world. Thank you to the Lore Alliance for inviting myself, myself and Weeby uh, here today. So for those of you who do not know me, uh, Daniel gave me a slight introduction. So I'm Joseph Farney, the head of sales and business development here at Weeby. A uh, quick overview on Weeby. We're disrupting the IoT space with our end-to-end -end solutions and our industry-leading IIoT SaaS platform, all while leveraging uh, the global LoRaWAN network. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the challenges we're seeing uh, in the oil and gas vertical. So uh, let's get direct insights from the voice of our customer uh, and some clients, global uh, organizations in the oil and gas uh, sector. So oftentimes when taking on an IIoT project uh, for a major corporation, it can often feel like a very daunting task and it can be hard to find the right place to start. Uh, you heard great insights earlier from Chevron, from Yokogawa. Um, what I always tell customers is focus on the challenges your business is trying to solve for today. Where can you make the immediate impact by installing technology to solve your uh, challenge that you have? <clears throat> so 
As you can see on the screen here, there's multiple challenges that the uh, sector faces, that companies face. Uh, a couple that stick out, I'm not gonna read them all to you, but uh, you know, needing to monitor assets in remote locations, right? Oil rigs, machines, tanks, pipelines. There's multiple different processes from upstream, midstream to downstream that all require digitization uh, technologies. With the recent pandemic, we've always seen now a rush to automate uh, and grow even larger uh, this push for digitalization for industries. So as I mentioned before, taking on these initiatives and projects uh, for companies with legacy infrastructure, legacy systems uh, can really seem challenging in more ways than just finding a way to start like you saw in the first slide to now taking on how are the implementation challenges gonna affect you and your organization. So here you'll see some common challenges that we come across in the ONG sector. Uh, equipments and assets that are located in harsh, ruggedized environments, whether it's offshore, whether it's, uh, as Chevron mentioned, in uh, you know, desert areas uh, across North America, um, but also getting access to the data in real time. Most importantly, a uh, rising cost of maintenance, labor, and also uh, what we hear from our customers is a skilled workforce shortage. This doesn't just go for the oil and gas sector, this goes for manufacturing, supply chain, uh, and so many others out there that are looking for IIoT uh, initiatives. So really, you can really see uh, connecting assets, uh, connecting the infrastructure, storing the data, uh, visualizing the data can be very challenging for uh, multiple different departments that are involved in these initiatives uh, to take on. Here I wanted to showcase uh, a recent use case uh, from a global company that uh, can showcase to you how simple it truly is to take on an industrial IoT idea from project, whiteboard, to really reality. Uh, here you can see the company took their conceptual IoT project uh, to implementation in just mid minutes. So with the insights you see here, our visual IoT platform, you can see how a company uh, can easily leverage uh, the Yokogawa Sushi Center that Kevin showcased, simply attach that sensor to a LoRaWAN network, uh, and then start pushing that information through a multi-tech gateway, which you see on the far right of your screen. Uh, and you can really start to see how easy it is to connect a sensor, connect a network, connected back to a platform, right? And that's where you start getting real-time data uh, for remote locations and managing this. This use case was happened to be uh, in an oil field on the West Coast. So here you can see the dashboard of the Weeby Visual IoT platform, uh, the SaaS infrastructure that you can easily stand up within minutes uh, to connect your sensors, devices, assets, uh, and machines across your uh, organization. Uh, the user-friendly interface really provides uh, clients, customers, any end user uh, with true visibility into their uh, machines that they're monitoring. So, for example, you see a vibration sensor monitoring the vibration levels at the lower right-hand corner of the screen, but really it comes to how does machine learning, AI, uh, leverage this data to make it more usable and take out the human errors uh, from the manual processes of checking machines, being reactive to machine breaking or going down. And lastly, I uh, wanted to showcase here the device actually in motion, right? So here you'll see the actual use case of how the uh, platform uh, here at Weeby help prevent a motor breakdown. You'll see where the sensor starts to learn the motor's actual behavior and its normal operations on a day-by-day -day basis uh, and its respective behaviors from the sensors that were implemented on this uh, machine. So with machine learning and AI capabilities of our platform, it lets the sensor um, and, you know, really takes advantage of the machine learning capabilities. So as you can see, normal behavior from the far left all the way, and then 
it has a detect, it has an event, and then it alerts you, right? So now you're proactively implementing solutions that give you real-time insights and data, but you can manage this from afar. Uh, most importantly, it detects you know those anomalies and pushes that information out to you via SMS, via text, uh, via email, uh, and it can cross multiple different departments, whether your facilities, operations, uh, technology divisions within an organization. Everyone can get that data, and then leverage that data with one single pane of glass with the platform to then manage your operations more effectively and more efficiently. Um, you know, I just want to share one word of wisdom that I once heard from a very wise customer uh, in the early days of machine to machine, which obviously now we call IIoT, IoT. Uh, the data you extract is rendered useless until you put that data into motion and action. Well, now we've seen the evolution. Now we have the ability to put that data into action, leverage AI, create operational efficiencies, and most importantly, scale at a fast pace, where traditional deployments took months and months for an organization to stand up. Now, we can just do that in hours. Over to you, Daniel. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, guys. That's a great overview of some of the success stories we've been seeing in the uh, oil and gas industry. Now, let's take a look at how LoRaWAN is an agile game changer for chemical plants. Over to you, Frank. Yes, thank you, Dan. Uh, so I'm Frank Gillison from uh, Aloxi, and uh, today I want to start with reiterating a little bit why uh, LP1, uh, IoT, and specifically LoRaWAN is so interesting for the for the chemical industries. I have a few examples of the use cases we see in the chemical industry, and I want to go into one specific use case uh, a, a little bit more in detail. Um, and then show you uh, show you a little bit the architecture of, of how that looks like in a, in a chemical plant. Um, so let's start with with the industry characteristics and and how they benefit uh, or how IoT benefits these. Uh, so first of all, we see that it's, it's a very asset heavy industry. It means that, that there's a lot from everything. There's a lot. There's a lot of pipes, a lot of vessels, a lot of valves, a lot of pumps. So obviously, um, because of IoT and LP1 operates at low power. The sensor price is relatively low cost, and therefore the high numbers do not have a, have a direct uh, huge impact on the on the investment. Uh, we also see that the the sites uh, that are covered are can be really big, like Philippe showed. But even a, a typical refinery or chemical plant is a relatively large area for a wireless network, because of the characteristics of LoRaWAN, it can be covered by by a relatively low number of uh, of gateways. So the infrastructure cost. Uh, is also relatively low. Then uh, the security demand that was already mentioned by uh, by Chevron and obviously uh, Laura Wen uh, provides provides in that. Um, and we see in the chemical industry a lot of let's say mechanical equipment, so uh, valves that are manual valves or pipes or vessels that typically have no electronics or switches attached, so they are a blind spot in the in the field. Uh, so there is uh, a lot of use cases and a lot of data to be gained. Um, <clears throat> then there is a, there is a, a, a high focus on, uh, on on certification, uh, robustness, and and typically the, uh, the the existing technology is quite costly. And again, uh, the, the the low power sensors can uh, can can be a real game changer in that. And finally, uh, yeah, we we don't have to say that it's very expensive to wire uh, in a brownfield area. So the the wireless connection really uh, can can make business cases or use cases that were uh, impossible before uh, make that possible uh, with the, with this type of uh, technology. So what we see in the chemical industry, obviously there's a lot of equipment, rotating equipment, uh, pumps, compressors that need to be monitored. Um, so the vibration sensor like the sushi from Yokogawa can be used for that. Um, there are tons of valves, uh, manual valves specifically. So these valves are all uh, often in front uh, and after every piece of equipment. So in front and after a pump or a valve or sorry or a, or a vessel that need to be taken out in case of maintenance. And it's very important that these valves are monitored and uh, put in the right uh, position when you start to do the maintenance, but also put it back when the maintenance is uh, is done. Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> valve monitoring can also be used to guide operators in switching. So during a lineup or a, in a chemical plant in a, in a batch process where they switch from one uh, product to the other, uh, it needs to be monitored correctly that all the valves are in the right position before uh, the switching uh, and, and the, the, the system is reactivated. And um, historically, the, this, this is always done by manual uh, checks and uh, doing this now uh, digitally pr uh, increases efficiency and safety significantly. Um, so temperature monitoring also, one of the SUSI sensors can do that, is also um, used in the chemical industry to detect a material, for example, uh, on heat exchangers, vessels, pipes, uh, with, a, with a surface monitoring of the, of the temperature, you can already gain a lot of data. Um, and finally, uh, emergency showers. There's, there's a lot of emergency showers in the plant. Uh, and uh, when you, when you uh, put a sensor on those and know when they are activated, this provides uh, some great insights. So that last uh, use case, I want to take uh, take uh, take up later on and uh, and show you a little bit more uh, in more detail. But before we do that, uh, I want to take you a little bit through the uh, the architecture of this uh, of how this would look like. Uh, so on the left side, we start with the sensors. Uh, in this example, the Aloxy valve position sensor, the emergency shower sensor, the Yokogawa sensor. I mean. Any type of sensor uh, can be connected. Um, the, the number of FM approved sensors, so the class one div two sensors is, is increasing. Um, and if you want to know more, uh, definitely uh, join the, the LoRaWAN Alliance or look on the website to find out which sensors are, uh, are available. So these sensors all operate on LoRaWAN and uh, are then connected to a gateway. Uh, we use the multi-tech gateways. Most often they have an IP67 outdoor gateway, which is ideal for the chemical industry. And this gateway is then connected over 3G or uh, through an Ethernet connection, through uh, either the cloud or an on-prem uh, server, uh, where the Aloxy hub is installed. And this is an, uh, an additional piece of software that does some of the computing of the more uh, complex sensors, like valve position calculations, uh, but it also uh, can do the network monitoring. It can host the, the LoRa One network server, gateway management, uh, but mainly, uh, yeah, provide provide uh, all the management around the devices uh, and the network. And um, there, this, uh, this IoT hub has uh, an open connection, open APIs to then the customer system. Um, so that, that is where you will see uh, typically the IoT platforms to do the data storage, data visualization, data analytics, as we have seen in the previously presentation from Weavey. So all together, you see how an ecosystem uh, with, with all different types of LoRa when Alliance members is, uh, is built up and how, how eventually you come to an end-to-end -end solution uh, to, to make these use cases uh, uh, happen and, to, uh, um, and to, to get the benefits that, that obviously we are after. Um, so as mentioned, we've seen there is a lot, uh, there is a lot of, uh, of opportunity and uh, the specific opportunity I want to do a little bit more detail in is the uh, connected emergency showers. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, first of all, the emergency shower is, is basically, um, is basically a, a shower for people to wash when they are contaminated with uh, some kind of, uh, of dangerous substance. Um, sometimes uh, 10 to 15 seconds can really be critical. So these emergency showers are widespread over the plant so that you're always uh, very close to one of these, uh, these showers. So there are a lot and they're widely spread over the plant. Um, they are uh, not connected because uh, it's often a simple handle of the, of the, of the water valve. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it has no connection to the control room or to any system. So it's a blind spot uh, whether they are used or not, or whether they are on or not, whether they work. Um, and you need people uh, to react swiftly uh, in case uh, one is used because obviously it can, there can be a life at stake, but 
it could also be somebody's eyes or burning uh, on the skin. So it's very important that the emergency response teams uh, react swiftly. Um, and then finally, there is a they need there's some law or law regulation behind it as well to inspect it and to open it frequently. Um, OSHA is, is, is doing some uh, serious fines on when the equipment fails, uh, but also uh, there are some NC uh, regulations on, on to operate uh, these showers uh, on a weekly basis, actually. Um, one of the reasons, obviously, to, to prove that it works correctly, but also to prevent Legionella bacteria to build up in the, in the pipelines. Um, so this is a little bit uh, why that shower uh, is so important and, and why it, uh, it could be connected. Um, so what we have done is that uh, the handle that I was referring to that, that basically opens the water to the shower uh, is provided uh, with an alloxypole sensor which monitors the movement. So once somebody pulls the lever down, the handle moves 90 degrees and, this, and our sensor will wake up, record the movement and send it uh, through the ecosystem as we just seen to the, to the, to the back end. The whole ecosystem might look a little bit complex, but actually the, uh, in, in the, the proof of concepts we have done, uh, it's, it's, it's a few seconds uh, latency. So it's really a real time uh, alarm that you get in the uh, in the um, uh, in the control room. Well, first of all, you can have immediate response times uh, of the teams that need to go there. Uh, but you also have automated incident reporting. So there's a timestamp of when the shower is used, and this could be the trigger of a, of a digitalization project where you then time timestamp and generate an uh, an incident report. Uh, it also uh, generates automatically, or could gener uh, could be the starting point of of, uh, of a reporting uh, of an inspection uh, reporting um, plan. Uh, again, it is time stamped. So if you want to have a, a weekly opening of of a hundred different showers, how do you how do you capture that in an Excel sheet? Well, this is again a digital transformation project you could do, and uh, and it starts with the, the this timestamp of when the shower and which shower was exactly used. Um, and of course, uh, if the, if the lever uh, drops down, if the shower remains open, if it's broken, that is also uh, detected by the by the sensor. So uh, there's some additional uh, cost saving in in terms of uh, of making sure your sensor your uh, showers are always working so uh, initially uh, a lot of uh, a big safety um, advantage but again also a lot of efficiency gains uh, to get here um, so um to um to show you a little bit that this is not just the, the theory uh we we see uh these use cases come back with different customers uh we see different type of architectures uh, ranging from private cloud to public cloud, to on-premise solutions, and there's there's different proof of concepts and trials going on at uh, at large oil and gas and chemical sites or, already. So uh, it's it's definitely something that is full in motion. Um, good. So thank you, and uh, back over to you, Dan. Yeah, thanks, Frank. Uh, great examples of stranded assets now economically connected improving cost efficiencies and workforce safety. So thanks for that. Right, over to you, Denis, to discuss the impact of LoRaWAN in mining. Thank you. So one of the characteristics of the mining industry is that it's very dangerous, right? Um, one of the last sailing stamps failures that happened in 2019 killed 270 people, and that's only one event. And unlike uh, what most people could think, these events are because the serious and very serious uh, category of these events is increasing in the last few years. So more than half of the events that happened in the last century happened in the last 30 years. This is why we want to present here a solution regarding the tailing dams themselves. Tailing dams are one part of the mining industry. Uh, basically, the mining process starts with the rocks containing the minerals and the metals. Once they have been mined and the, uh, the minerals and the metals are removed from the earth, uh, the rocks are finely ground and they're mixed with waters in order to separate the minerals and the metals. 
The design minerals and metals are what is actually of value for the mining industries, and this is removed from the whole um, the whole material. And the remains, which are slurry, are known as tailings. And in order to store these, we build tailings dams and uh, create huge ponds in which these uh, these materials are being stored. The event I was telling you about was the failure of uh, one of these tailings dams, and this is a picture of it in Brumadinho in Brazil. And the failures over the last 100 years, they have led to a cumulative loss of about 3,000 people. So this is a very important aspect. The, 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 the breakage in Brumadinho costs the, the company, or the mining operator company, about $7 billion. So this is something that really has a big impact on the companies themselves. And um, a recent survey showed that about 1% to 2% of these tailings dams in the world are sufficiently monitored. So many of them, whether they're active or not active, are not being monitored because they are of no value to the mining companies themselves. And they are built in a progressive ways, so they are really getting towards their limits. One of the solutions that are being used to monitor these places are in-ground sensors, and they can be monitored. Uh, they can be used more and more to monitor these uh, these structures to ensure uh, better safety. The in-ground sensors enable the implementation of actions. So when an alert is given, you know that something is going wrong with the structure, and you can take actions before the the failure actually occurs. This is a representation of uh, when the cumulative deaths happened. So as you can see, although in the first half of the century, um, many deaths occurred, m many events happened in the, uh, in the last 30 years. So World Sensing proposes a solution for the monitoring of such structures, uh, which is the load sensing wireless monitoring solution, which is comprised of edge devices. Uh, which are robust, low power, reliable, and provide a secure network of LoRa and LoRaWAN devices. And they're compatible with a wide range of geotechnical, geospatial, and structural sensors to be placed in situ to monitor the structure. And there is a second aspect of the solution, which is the connectivity and network management part, where we use a star network topology with LoRa, longer range, not affected by radio signal obstructions, and we do not need repeaters or network planning. This is not critical path dependent, so if a node fails, all the other nodes uh, still communicate with the, the central point. And the device and data and network monitoring software can be used as well as a configuration mobile app to make the solution simpler. And we can review and manage the network itself to know when something is going to go wrong or to know when something goes wrong with the communication aspect. There are two embodiments to our solution, the, the, the cloud version, CMT cloud, where we have wireless data loggers that collect the information from the sensors and use long range protocols to send the information to multiple gateways. And the best gateway at that time sends the information over internet protocol to the CMT cloud, where we store the data and manage the network. And through API, MQTT, and different ways of connectivity, we can pass the information to third-party software for the end user. The other embodiment is a CMT Edge, which is used mainly for installations where people do not want uh, anyone to be able to get access to their information, so they have um, a better safety feature but uh, they do not have the same functionalities, although they can um, get all the information and also visualize it all in third-party software. So these components are generic to our solutions, and in the case of tailing stamps, we propose a complete solution that addresses several aspects of the infrastructure itself. For instance, one of the problems is when we have unstable tailing stamp walls, because of the soil stress. So it's important to monitor the pore water, and this pore water can be monitored by uh, piezometers inside a borehole, and we have specific nodes to connect this solution.
Another part of the solution addresses the problem of unstable tailings dam walls due to the ground movements. In this case, the horizontal displacement must be monitored and in place inclinometers are usually uh, the best solution. Other parameters can be the flooding or the overflow due to heavy rains or ice melt, which um, provoke an added pressure on the structure itself. So water level can be used to monitor the level of the pond itself with water level meters. Flooding or over flooding due to heavy rain can also be monitored through rainfall monitoring and rain gauges can be used with, uh, with the solution. Another aspect is that of the leakage of the chemicals and water contamination, where sometimes you can get an idea that something is going wrong by analyzing the effects that this has on the environment uh, down, down the line further along the, um, the tailing sand walls. So movement across surface cracks can be used and crack meters can help detect whether there is a leakage of these chemicals and water uh, contaminants. Unstable tailings dams walls can also be due to ground movement. So the vertical deformation at various depths can be monitored with multipoint ball extensometers. Landslides can also be studied with tension monitoring and the remaining load on the anchorage through the use of load cells. Water contamination is also something that can give you an idea on whether there is a leak in the tailings dam structure. So the water quality monitoring can be performed with Water Quality Pro. And finally, using all the different digital nodes, we can forward the information to the central gateway or in the case of the CMT cloud, the multi-gateway, so you can have several devices. And this is sent to the software, which is a key component of our solution where you can get several user access and data storage, and you can get different pro profiles depending on the, um, the person involved in the process to get different types of information, whether it has to be on the alert side or whether it has to be on the more technical side. The network monitoring can be accessed as well, and you can get access to the whole system setup. And the main advantages of this solution is that uh, it has been certified in many countries and for many applications. It is IP67 uh, compatible, or at least regarding the, the hardware. It connects several kinds of sensors uh, thanks to the LoRa technology. We can reduce the cost with the material and the infrastructure of the monitoring solution, and it reduces the time and the cost of implementation for the execution of the project. So this is the, the complete solution for that kind of use cases. Back to you, Dan. Yeah, thanks, Danny. Thanks for that. That's, that's quite a solution you have there. A um, lot of different points of measurements. So uh, a big thank you to our Destination Laura Wan sponsors who help make these webcasts possible. Thank you to Machine Q, a Comcast company, as the Destination Laura Wan Gold sponsor, and our two silver sponsors, Birds Communication and, uh, and, and sorry, Birds and Charter Communication. Um, and thank you to our Law Alliance members who participated today. I hope you got a lot out of this. Please take a few moments to learn about the amazing benefits that are available to Laura members by viewing the membership benefits documents in the resources tab down there. Um, the Laura Alliance drives the future of Laura when, and we want to help um, shape that future for you. And. Uh, um, the Laura Alliance will be bringing new content nearly every week to Destination Laura Wan. Please visit the Destination Laura Wan Engagement Hub and sign up for notifications for upcoming webcasts. If you or a colleague would like to view this webcast again, as I said at the beginning, it should be available within about 24 hours uh, for you guys to download. Right. Well, guys, let's move to the uh, the Q&A section here. Um, I've seen quite a lot of uh, questions come in. I think we answered a couple of them, but uh, let's let's see see what we got here.
Right, let's start having a little look at some of these questions here. So I'll start off with a fairly simple one here. Um, thanks, Rosario, for this one. Um, what's the range of a LoRaWAN gateway in terms of kilometers or, or miles? So, you know, we've all heard of, uh, you know, communication from outer space, hundreds of miles range, looking down into valleys from tops of hills, you know, at 15 plus miles. Um, on top of antennas that are, you know, way up on TV transmitters in flat open countries, you know, going for 20, 30 miles. But, uh, but Kevin, um, give us an idea what you tend to see in, in more industrial environments, real, real life environments. So thank you, Daniel. It, it really, you know, depends on the environment. So if you're in a, uh, refinery or chemical plant, you know, with vessels and significant amount of piping, it's, you know, best practice to put the gateway antenna at, you know, as high up as possible to be able to see down through the pipes and the and work around some of the other obstructions. So, you know, typically we could see a kilometer or, or, or more. It, you know, there's a very, we're able to work with a very uh, weak signal and have great results. So, um, the, the coverage tends to be very good. If you're in an outdoor environment, you know, where there's, you know, few obstructions, few trees, et cetera, you know, you, you could get five to 10 kilometers if you have the, you know, the gateway antenna at height. Um, you start needing to consider, you know, the paths of the communication from the sensors if they're fixed to the, to the antenna height to make sure there's not a hill or something in between to block that path. So, consider a, a path study or something. Right. Well, thanks uh, for that, uh, Kevin. And, and bear in mind, uh, a kilometer in a refinery or a chemical plant, I mean, that's huge with, with all of those liquids moving around, all of that metal, the sheer amount of communication going on in that 900 meg or 800 meg band in, in Europe. Um, I mean, that's that's pretty stunning. Uh, we also had another question also from Ro Rosario that, that links well to this, which is, you know, don't you get saturation in the end? Don't you end up having so many devices out there um, that it that they all cause interference and and it's very difficult to connect to those assets. So, Philippe, maybe uh, this one's a good question for you. You know, those oil fields that that you you guys are building up and managing. You know, they're pretty noisy environments with a lot of different technologies in them. Yeah, thank, thank you, Dan. Uh, yes, I mean, we see, uh, we always have to make sure we understand uh, the interference and, and the noise level, right? The big advantage of LoRa is really built on a sturdy uh, link budget, right? Uh, uh, and so you have a good receiver sensitivity. And, and so you don't transmit a lot of data, but you transmit um, data that is needed uh, um, and not all the time. So it's really leveraging and, and operating the in the frequency and in the uh, ISM band the best way possible from what we saw. And thanks to that living budget, that's really what you get for the very wide coverage area uh, um, where you have a lot of space uh, or in a plant or refinery. Uh, that's what we were talking about. That also helps uh, penetrating metal and being able to go further than any other technology for the time for that we saw for the time being. So. Um, you always have to be aware of other other um, noise and other uh, frequency being operated, but really, really the, the, the chip and the way the, the space spread spectrum is used for LoRa uh, enables uh, a good way of transmitting data. All right, thanks for that, Philippe. Um, Mohammed, uh, you asked about um, information on deployment of LoRa and gateways. Um, I think if you go down to the resources piece in the engagement tool at the bottom, I think it's in there, um, there's some information uh, in, in there uh, around actually the deployment of, of Chevron that might be interesting for you there. Um, so, so we've got an interesting question here um, about the delay, right? Um, 
LoRaWAN is near real time, um, but it is not millisecond latency. And so is a delay of 0.4 to 0.8 seconds, is, is that tolerable for an industrial setting? So, uh, so Philippe, you want to start that one for us? Yes, sure, definitely. I mean, again, I mean, for us, we are looking at LoRaWAN as a way to gather data from the field uh, that we couldn't do before. So, uh, and where why your solution is not either uh, feasible or not, um, it's too expensive to deploy, right? So, it's enabling us to get more data points from our field environment, and we're not going to uh, use LoRaWAN for anything that's critical that could put life in danger, right? It's more like, okay, get the data uh, from system that you need, but not use it for alarm and control or things like that. That's really our point of view. Um, Joseph, you want to come in on that um, with respect to um, AI and intelligence of that data? Do you need that data, you know, in millisecond latency? Yeah, great question, and uh, thank you for that. You know, what we see on the software side and, you know, integrating sensors, uh, a lot of times in the industrial IoT space, especially in connecting legacy assets that are usually uh, a part of a manual operation to where someone's, let's just take an example of checking a machine, you know, two times a day. You don't need that uh, in real time, uh, you know, like you would for robotics type surgery. So what we're seeing is customers coming to us and asking us, you know, connecting uh, legacy sensors, devices, and, you know, giving them visibility into an operations or, you know, replacing a manual type process. Uh, to where low latency or, you know, a high bandwidth type application wouldn't be necessarily the, you know, the end means there. But, uh, you know, each application has their end goal. Uh, but what we see in the IoT space, especially in the ONG sector uh, and vertical, is that, uh, you know, you can transport those data packets um, with a little bit uh, higher latency. So thank you, Daniel. Yeah, uh, thanks for that, uh, Joe. So this one goes out to you, Frank. Um, you've got a lot of experience uh, certifying devices. So um, does LoRa frequency from the node to the gateway get affected by the hazardous zone? Uh, hi there. No, thank you uh, uh, for the introduction. No, it it, it doesn't. So it's. Uh, uh, no, it, it does not at all. So uh, obviously the, the devices that are used inside the zones need to be certified to be used in that zone. So in Europe, ATAX, uh, in the in the US, it will be class 1 div 2 or class 1 div, div 1. Uh, and once the devices that are certified to that uh, certification, they will be tested, uh, obviously, to, to not uh, not affect any of the uh, of the other equipment in those areas. So, so on that note, then, when is LoRa certification a must uh, for sensors? Um, it, perhaps you can answer that from uh, a regulatory perspective, um, from an industry perspective, and then also from that hazardous zone perspective. Um, you, yeah, so the, I think the LoRa one uh, certification itself is a must when you when you look at the uh, uh, at, at the security and and about the interoperability of of, uh, of the of the whole ecosystem. So if if everything uh, works according to the to the, the LoRa one standard, it all uh, connects and works uh, works very well together. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't think it really affects the hazardous uh, aspect because that that's really a separate certification. But I think mainly the security aspect of uh, of it is is the main uh, the main point. Right. Okay. Um, so, um, um, uh, Denny, um, do you want to also um, comment on on the challenges or or, or the um, the, the need for certification. How, how do you do? You have specific certifications that are specific to the mining industry that are on top of um, interoperability and regulatory compliance. 
Yes, in most cases, we need to adapt to the certification of uh, specific countries and also to the regulations. For instance, because of the incident we referred to or the accident in Brumadinho, uh, there are new regulations in Brazil that, um, that were installed last year, and we have to comply with that. And then there are specific certifications, such as the Anatel in Brazil, but um, many countries have specific uh, regulations which we have to comply with indeed. Right, okay. Well, thanks ever so much. I think I'm probably going to have to end here as we're, we're coming up with this last question. Is there a clear benefit for using MQTT protocol between the gateway and uh, and the servers? So uh, I'll ask that to a few of you, but uh, um, Frank, you want to kick off with that one? MQ2, MQTT between gateways and servers? Uh, <clears throat> yes, I think we, 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 see different, uh, we see different protocols being used. I think MQTT has a high scalability and, and reliability factors. Um, but it, yeah, it really depends probably on the, on the, on the, on the characteristics that, uh, of, of the company that, uh, uh, that it does the implementation what they prefer, but but uh, to my knowledge, MQTT is mainly scalability and reliability of the of the connection. Uh, Kevin, um, you want to jump in on on that one as well? Sure, MQTT I'm kidding, I'm so, to the servers. So, so what I would add, you know, there as well is you know the benefits of the you know publish subscribe nature of the MQTT brokers and systems to be able to direct the the data and participate, um, you know, at, at various um, and end user nodes, whether it's in a cloud or something on premise, um, you're you're able to you know then direct the data and, and respond as necessary is another benefit. And, uh, and and I guess we'll finish up here with uh, Philippe. Um, you want to weigh in on on your experience and opinions with MQTT? Yeah, I mean uh, it goes back to what I was saying in my presentation. You know, uh, MQTT is kind of a standard protocol for IoT uh, data transmission. So uh, again, uh, for us, using standards is really helping us. Again, and I think it was also mentioned, it helps us scale. Uh, tremendously. So this is our point of view. I mean, trying to really leverage all different types of standards that we can, we can use in our environment. Uh, we don't want to have a different protocol for each services, right? It's The point is to be able to transmit the data the best way, securely and reliably. All right, thanks, uh, Philippe. Uh, we also at Multitech, we've we've okay. seen definite benefit in using MQTT, particularly on-prem, where there's a lot of isolated process control networks that are not connected to cloud platforms. They're very local systems, and and that gives you the versatility to subscribe and publish data between assets coming in on LoRa. Um, into other systems and it also enables you to inject data higher up into the stack so you can bypass uh, a lot of SCADA systems uh, or, or the lower layers of those Purdue models in those SCADA systems. So, so definitely MQTT is picking up in um, popularity and there's uh, other standards now um, moving ahead uh, based on that like Spark Plug B um, which is something is Mar that you might want to take a little look at Spark Plug B. Right, well, thanks ever so much. Um, we're about 10 past the hour here, so it's been um, a, a great webcast. Um, a big thank here to everybody who was uh, on the panel, uh, Denis, Frank, uh, Joe, Philippe, um, and, uh, and Kevin. It's uh, been a pleasure having you here today. Thank you, everybody, for turning up. And I also wanted to say a big thanks to uh, John Polly from Chevron, who put a lot of work into the uh, white paper and, and really helped um, um, bring a, a lot of this technology through here in, in this oil and gas space in Chevron, along with uh, Philip and his uh, team there. So thanks, uh, John. You'll be missed. And uh, to everybody else, thanks ever so much uh, for being on the uh, on the webcast today. I look forward to um, seeing you all at events soon.